Ich begrüße Ethan Young hier in der Rosa-Luxemburg-Stiftung. Ethan engagiert sich seit Jahrzehnten in der US-Linken, derzeit vor allen Dingen im Left Labor Project, einem New Yorker Zusammenschluss linker Gewerkschaften und in portside.org, einer der wichtigsten Internetportale der US-Linken. Ethan lebt als freier Autor in Brooklyn und hat kürzlich die Studie Risse im Beton, linke Wahlerfolge in den Vereinigten Staaten verfasst, von der, glaube ich, noch einige Exemplare da vorne liegen, für Sie zu mitnehmen oder sonst kann man die auch von der Webpage herunterladen. Und bevor wir einsteigen in das Thema des heutigen Abends, ähm, möchten wir Sie bitten, an einer kleinen Aktivität, Zeremonie ist vielleicht ein bisschen hochgegriffen, Ethan wird das erklären, im Angedenken an Quentin Young teilzunehmen. Quentin Young ist Isens Vater, der kürzlich verstorben ist. Und Quentin Young ist in den USA, in der US-Linken, eine sehr bekannte Persönlichkeit, die ihr Leben lang für kommunistische und sozialistische Ideale gekämpft hat. Und ich würde jetzt das Wort an Isen geben und der wird Ihnen sagen, was Sie zu tun haben oder tun können. Thank you. I'd also like to uh, also thank my magnificent comrades who have accompanied me on this great journey. It's a high point of my life. And Emily, Lauren, and Lucy, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. My father uh, worked for many years. Uh, in the health rights movement as uh, both as a, an activist and a leader. And uh, he just died this past week uh, at the age of 92. So we're not, uh, we're not spending a lot of time mourning, in the words of uh, Joe Hill, the great American uh, wobbly, the, I, uh, uh, the songwriter for the industrial workers of the world, uh, we don't mourn, we organize. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Quentin's uh, work. In the last years of his life, he was involved in the struggle to uh, bring, bring into being a, a national health plan which would cover everybody in the country. Uh, known as single payer, it's essentially socialized medicine, but it's a very simple, not so radical proposal, much like what uh, we have in Canada. And when Quentin would uh, speak at rallies uh, and try to explain the f way that this system is supposed to work, he would lead his audience in a chant. Uh, he would say, everybody in, and the people would respond, everybody in, and then he'd say, nobody out, and the people would respond, nobody out. So I'm going to demand that you do that right now. <laughs> All right, you ready? Everybody in. Everybody in. Nobody, out. nobody out. Thank you very much. Ja, und damit sind wir auch eigentlich schon mittendrin im Thema, denn die Gesundheitsversorgung für alle ist eine der Hauptforderungen eines der Kandidaten, eigentlich der Kandidat, der für uns natürlich, wo wir ein besonderes Auge drauf haben, Bernie Sanders. Aber beginnen wir von vorne, ganz kurz. Die, Wahlen der, die Wahl der Kandidaten oder für die demokratische oder die republikanische Partei läuft seit dem 1. Februar in den USA und hält eigentlich das ganze Land in Atem. Und mittlerweile hat sich das breite Feld, wie wir wissen, auch auf äh, zwei Kandidaten auf der republikanischen Seite runtergekocht, wobei die anderen haben vielleicht noch eine Möglichkeit, da wird Eason uns was zu sagen. Äh, das ist einmal der äh, Milliardär Donald Trump ähm, und der evangelikal-konservative Ted Cruz. Und auf der anderen Seite ist die ähm, Kandidatin des politischen Establishment Hillary Clinton und der äh, demokratische Sozialist Bernie Sanders. Und ich sage jetzt nicht, wie in den Mainstream-Medien immer gesagt, der Bernie Sanders, der sich als demokratischen Sozialisten bezeichnet. Ich finde, das ist eigentlich eine Unverschämtheit. Aber gut, auch darüber können wir noch mal drüber reden. Ähm, 
Und selten hat eigentlich die Bestimmung oder schon die Diskussion um die Präsidentschaftskandidaten äh, so sehr die Gemüter bewegt. Ich denke, da trägt natürlich ein, ein Donald Trump mit seinen rassistischen Äußerungen zu bei. Äh, da trägt aber auch ein Bernie Sanders zu bei, der wirklich äh, junge Menschen über die ganze Nation hinweg mitreißt mit seinen nach, würde ich mal sagen, deutschen Vorstellungen, eher sozialdemokratischen und sozialstaatlichen Forderungen nach freier ähm, Gesundheitsvorsorge, nach einem Mindestlohn etc. etc. Ähm, er fordert allerdings auch eine politische Revolution und damit greift er das politische Establishment auch seiner eigenen Partei an und wird entsprechend auch wenig von dieser unterstützt. Ähm, und ich denke mal, außen vor bleibt im Grunde genommen die politische Mitte, und die bürgerliche Mitte und das ist ja was, was wir auch hier in Europa erleben und ähm, auch da wird es heute Abend Gelegenheit zu geben, ähm, nochmal zu gucken, also wo sind Parallelen, wo sind nicht Parallelen. Und bevor wir jetzt mit Ethan einsteigen, ähm, haben wir überlegt, dass wir gerne ähm, von den vier Kandidaten vier Wahlspots zeigen würden, um auch mal so ein bisschen, damit sie ein bisschen mitbekommen, wie ist die Stimmung, äh, was gibt es für Vorschläge, beziehungsweise wo sind Einfach völlige Leerstellen, aber das werden Sie auch selber sehen. Insofern ähm, sind insgesamt acht Minuten, ist nicht so lang. Well, I, I'll, I'll comment a little bit about these, these spots. Uh, the first one from Trump isn't really an ad. It was a, a, a kind of... A, He was having a big rally and some local people decided to come up with a little act, which was basically sort of a kitsch mashup uh, in which they combined uh, an old World War I patriotic song with some of the themes from Trump's campaign and dress up like red, white, and blue cheerleaders. And because they were, che they were little cheerleaders, you had that element of innocent sexuality thrown into it. And, uh, These are all themes that are very popular uh, in, across the country, but when ordinary people do it, it's just sort of kind of corny in most people's minds, but cute. I thought it was cute. I thought, you know, I actually kind of dug it, but um, <laughs> because it had that sort of homemade quality to it. That was not something planned by Trump. But there's another aspect to it too, which is that because people often look at that sort of thing as corny, and especially in New York, where people just look at it and go, God, how embarrassing. Um, it, and Trump is a New Yorker. So what it actually shows is his utter contempt for his own base, which you sometimes find, sometimes he'll, since he always runs off at the mouth, he'll sometimes say something like, I meet highly educated people, they love me. I meet poorly educa educated people, they love me too. I love poorly educated people. He actually said that, that's a quote. Okay, this is his way of expressing his disdain for everybody. And, uh, and, he, and having, you know, being able to put this kind of show on is just sort of like saying, we're gonna give the suckers what they want. And anybody who knows anything about the type of person he is and where he comes from, can see that automatically, which is not to say that the people who are cheering are necessarily stupid. They, I think they, that they're just excited about being part of the campaign, and this is a little bit of local you know, entertainment that was cooked up by some local people, probably on their own, and then they showed it to the campaign people, and they said, great, do it, you know? Um, but that's sort of Trump. Trump basically tries to convince people that he loves them and convince them to love him, and then he uses them. That's what he does, not, not just in politics, but every living moment of his life. And uh, the second one was Cruz. Now that was, the contrast in, in those two spots really shows a little bit about the contrast in the two candidates. Cruz is, Cruz's spot was extremely well produced, obviously very expensive, but at the same time, its targets were the traditional targets of right-wing populists. So he was aiming his fire at people in suits, highly paid professionals, and saying, if they could only experience what we're experiencing, they would fold up in a minute, whereas we are the ones who have to actually suffer and deal with 
uh, the the influx of of, uh, of immigrants, legal and illegal, because in fact, as far as Cruz and his base are concerned, they're they're the same thing. It's really a racial thing. It's not about crossing borders or any of that nonsense. That's just the kind of r rhetoric that they try to use to cover up the racism. But um, that cover is slipping away all the time on, by their choice, not by anybody else's choice, not through any kind of exposure or anything, because they're advancing further and further to the right. Um, now, uh, the Hillary piece, I think, is really interesting, because what she's doing, essentially, is presenting people as passive and apolitical and basically concerned only about the most mundane features of their lives. And she comes in at the end and sort of like says, we're adorable, we're diverse, all of your votes count, and I will protect you. And that's, that's her basic campaign theme, uh, that she's the one who can handle all the, all the adversity that's come up in American life and sort of get, make it all better. But she doesn't really have much of a program for making it all better. She just sort of like identifies problems and says, we'll fix that. And finally, we have Bernie. Now, that commercial is the first time I saw it. It's not bad. It basically puts out what, it does what Bernie does, which is he gets up in front of a crowd of people, and he tells them what it, why he thinks it's necessary to put forward some, what are actually some very radical demands relative to every other candidate, and certainly relative to the general direction of both the permanent political parties in the United States. He gets up and says it, and then to everybody's amazement, not only does the individual respond positively, but everybody responds positively. And uh, it, 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 rather than involving appeals to your inner longings or inner fears, he's basically saying, if we get specific about what we want uh, and start making it a mass demand, then we have a chance of, of achieving it, but we have to stay focused and we have to keep on pushing for it. And, um, well, you know, I'm sort of in his corner. So we can, <laughs> we can talk about this some more. Uh, should I just go ahead and do my stuff here? Okay. All right. Um, this is a unique political situation that we're having in the United States. It's full of... of uh, incredible uh, new developments that literally no one anticipated that have basically broken all the rules in American politics and leaves a big, a big huge question mark over the direction of the country. Uh, the first thing that needs to be uh, considered in looking at this is the fact that uh, the crisis for the majority of people in the country economically has been of has been real and drastic so the recession of 2008 has been resolved as far as capital is concerned but for the 99% it's been horrible and has continued to be horrible uh, loss of jobs uh, cost of health care losing homes losing um, losing the ability to go to school, and if you don't go to school, you're essentially uh, finished in society as far as work is concerned. And uh, incarceration uh, growing and growing by the day with the US already having more prisoners than any other country. Um, in this context, we have, there has developed a political crisis in the two-party system, which has uh, gone beyond the, it, it's, it's gone beyond the limits of what people usually call a, a political crisis in the United States, which usually involves some kind of means of stabilizing the situation. And it also um, has broken down things, as I've mentioned before, in ways that nobody has seen before or anticipated. So I'll try to go into some of the details about this specifically in, in each party and what are the implications for the left in the United States. Um, 
We have a two-party system. It is fixed in stone. We don't have a system where there is two parties and then little satellite parties around it, or there are meaningful third-party efforts in various different places. You, we have a two-party system, and if you don't work within the two-party system, there are both legal and financial uh, roadblocks that inhibit the possibility of ever gaining office. That doesn't mean that it's absolute, that there are never independents winning or that small parties can't sometimes gain ground in certain particular areas and situations. But when it comes to the presidency in particular, and virtually every uh, federal office, that is, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, House of Representatives or the Senate, uh, those rules hold fast. And that's created a situation where the left has been really having to uh, struggle with basic questions about what the relationship should be, what our relationship should be to each party, to the two-party system as a whole, what are the prospects for actually starting a viable third party, what should we even be playing elections at all, should we concentrate on local elections or should we concentrate on the pres presidential elections. These are all things that people have been debating since the end of World War II when after the death of Franklin Roosevelt, which who had been really the, the rallying point for the left in the United States when it was probably at its strongest, despite the fact that it was connected to uh, uh, the New Deal wing of the Democratic Party. Uh, ever since then, there's been fights and various different attempts to break through this, uh, this conundrum and for the most part have completely failed time and time again. Um, so now here we are in 2016, and we have a situation where, on the one hand, the Republican Party uh, is down to three, but really only two, presidential prospects. And what we and one of them is not even a politician; he's just a, a crazy, sick man who has too much money and, you know, is so desirous of, of uh, universal approval and attention that he is going to, you know, he'll spend his last penny to convince everybody that he deserves to be president, not because he's interested in power, but because you can't get any higher than president. That's literally what's going on with this poor, sick man who doesn't deserve our pity, but, you know, there he is. Um, then opposing him are uh, other characters, but what, what, um, what's amazing, even in relation to the Reagan and the George W. Bush years, the far right has taken control of the Republican Party, okay? They don't listen to the, le to the, pe to the people who have the keys and who, f who payroll the party. They don't listen to capital anymore. They're uh, they're on a stampede to the right. Most of the uh, young elected officials, young senators and congressmen, are either completely corrupt or totally inexperienced, and they read Ayn Rand in high school. I don't know if people know about Ayn Rand, but you know it's a thing in the United States. Ayn Rand, the novelist who pushes selfishness and uh, the, the you know the the individual uberalis, and. Uh, so they're very excited about the idea of, tr of destroying government once and for all and letting, letting people, you know, freeing people to make all the money they can. Of course, they're thinking first and foremost of themselves. So they're not exactly fit to serve and they're not fit to run a political party, but in fact, that's exactly the position that they're in. And they can, at this point, they run the, the, the Republican Party, much to the horror of the capitalists in whose who ha whose will was the will of the party up until now. And that's one way that you call a political crisis. And on the Democratic side, you have a situation where they've always relied on uh, political apparatus and, uh, you know, it, in terms of getting the word out, vote getting, you know, doing the kind of ground research that's necessary to pull out a, uh, the, a majority vote and also involves, you know, making alliances, making promises, greasing palms, in other words, you know, passing money back and forth. A lot of money changes hands in an election. And, uh, 
and actually uh, setting the, the mechanism for getting, you know, deciding early who they want to have run and setting the mechanism in place early to make sure that that chosen candidate has everything behind him or her as they run for uh, the highest office in the land against another party which actually has more substantial uh, backing by capital but often slips in the public eye. You have a situation where there's just too much social tension to sustain a, uh, uh, even a center-right position uh, and so the, the, uh, the vote goes to the Democrat. Of course, there's a lot of other details about why the why one person might win over and one party might win over another, uh, and so we don't have one party. We have a system that's actually worked very well for capital, but it's gone a little bit haywire. And and the form that this takes in the Democratic Party is that this year, uh, virtually out of nowhere, an unknown nationally senator from a small state in New England, which is a region that is very different from the rest of the country, stepped in, challenged the selected candidate, declared himself a socialist, and, with, and also declared that he was not going to accept any money from corporations. And this was just a few short months ago. And in the time since then, he now has as much or more money as the selected candidate, and he's pulling in more people into huge rallies across the country than any of the other candidates of either party. I mean, his, his rallies outnumber Trump's. You don't hear about it, but that, in fact, is what's going on. The enthusiasm that's met Bernie Sanders is incredible. That does not mean he's going to win the election. That does not mean that he's going to be able to hurdle all the roadblocks that have been put, that, that are put in every candidate's place, particularly if they don't have strong backing from, from, uh, from capital, from various corporate funders and, and super rich funders. But it does mean that something very dramatic has changed in the United States. Uh, the, last, the last candidate for president who proclaimed himself a socialist to come anywhere near 100 votes was in 1912. That was Eugene Victor Debs who was the candidate of the Socialist Party at the height of the Socialist Movement when they had a broad, uh, a broad support movement across the country, cutting across uh, urban and rural lines in all kinds of states, reaching all kinds of workers. And that didn't make a million votes, but it was a four-way race. And the, this was one moment when the two-party system was at its weakest. The Socialist Movement was at its strongest. And he made an impressive showing, but that has never been repeated, ever. Not by a party proclaiming itself socialist, or not by a candidate within one of the capitalist parties proclaiming himself socialist, because there actually was room for that, but they made that room very, very narrow, and nobody even came within shouting distance of being able to do something like that. So there have been attempts throughout history. The, the, the author Upton Sinclair ran a strong campaign in, uh, I forget, it was in the 30s uh, as a Democrat, but with what was basically a social democratic platform. And he was crushed by the first use of modern, uh, first modern use of, of, of media to basically suppress a movement. Uh, something that's been, uh, that was picked up in, uh, in Germany and has been picked up uh, in the US ever since, uh, using newsreel, uh, mo mo newsreel movies at the theaters uh, the, and uh, using radio nonstop to try to uh, stop this campaign, and it worked. And here comes Bernie Sanders. And he doesn't have lots of TV ads, and he doesn't uh, have national recognition even. It's, it, it, it's, he's starting from absolute ground zero. What made the difference? Well, we can point to two things in particular. One is that he uh, has relied heavily on uh, social media, and the people who came into the arena 
were skilled with, who, who joined his campaign, he didn't call them, they came to him, were people who were experienced with using social media for political purposes via Occupy Wall Street and the Obama campaigns in 2008 and 2012. Uh, and they went to work, and it worked like a charm. It really, re the word reached people very, very rapidly, and people approved strongly not just of Bernie's message, but his approach, which was basically to, to tell the truth and say the same thing over and over again in case anybody came in late. And everybody picked up on it, and it didn't bother people. It wasn't, people apparently weren't bored by the fact that he was saying the same thing over and over again, because he was saying things that resonated with them very strongly. And what he was saying was, a number of demands, which were outlined in this, in this uh, last ad, uh, get big money out of politics, uh, single payer health care, uh, free higher education, public higher education, and uh, end the, uh, the prison industrial complex, which has resulted in such, you know, such a staggering rate of, of incarceration and also is part and parcel with the epidemic of police violence, which includes murder and torture as well as imprisonment and just general harassment of ordinary civilians going about their daily business, mostly because they're black and brown. And, uh, Let's see, I don't know, if, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I left anything out of the list. There's a lot, he, he goes on from there, but you get the general idea, right? Hmm? Oh yes, of course. <laughs> Raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Now, doing this, he's speaking directly to the condition of the working class in the United States, both the lower sectors, the less, the less, uh, uh, the, the sectors with less income and less skills and the sectors with more income and more skills, both of whom are on the firing line right now and who have long been polarized against each other and have not had anybody really step forward with an economic program which, could, which they could um, converge around that doesn't solve the problems that, that cause the, uh, the polarization the, um, and the, the many ways that, the many problems of uh, fragmentation, which have plagued the U.S. left for a long, long time, but it, it isn't nonetheless an incredible breakthrough. Not only that he raised it, but that people are actively responding to it. And um, getting back to his uh, his approach, his basic demands actually come from social movements that have been that were already working and operating and developing a, a base at the time he stepped into the, the electoral, pro, the presidential race, okay? He wasn't, those social movements, most of those social movements barely exist in Vermont. They're all, they're mostly in urban areas and in some rural areas, but he was, he was tuned in to what those demands were and what by, by giving voice to those demands, it wasn't just that he was making the public aware. The fact is that growing numbers of the public were already aware of it because of the work of social movements. So when a candidate stepped forward that had that kind of responsiveness to those demands, the people who had known of those demands responded as well. There's still a lot of problems, in particular with the leadership of social movements, in breaking through uh, a long established practice of relying heavily on, on the Democratic Party apparatus to, uh, for political influence, to a certain extent for funding, and for a sense of political legitimacy that has led many people to have already signed on with Hillary Clinton uh, before, her, before Bernie even entered into the race, and they're in a very bad position to try to break with, it, with her now, even if they, if, if they want to. They, they would have a very hard time doing it, and a lot of them don't want to. But um, nevertheless, uh, it reflects the actual condition of the American left that when a political movement comes in and actually challenges neoliberalism in a direct way and gets a response, it's mostly 
on the basis of speaking to issues that had already been the basis for a lot of organizing in a lot of different places. So he became a political pole, less from his direct relationship with social movements and more from the fact that, the, that his direction coincides with that of social movements, although you won't find people in, for example, in the single payer movement talking about a $15 minimum wage, and you won't necessarily find people talking about uh, abortion rights at the same time talking about, um, about strengthening labor unions. But these are all things that Bernie is, is putting out there. It's nothing new for him. This is the same stuff he's been talking about as a member of the Senate and before that as a member of the House of Representatives for a very long time. You can go, it's interesting. I think Pete, one of the benefits for him of, of uh, YouTube is that people go and look, they, they can look at speeches that Hillary made this week and then go back and see speeches Hillary, Hillary made uh, 20 years ago and then go back to speeches that Hillary made last week and she, you get three different positions. But if you go back and look at at uh, speeches that Bernie Sanders made 20 years ago, he's saying exactly the same thing. And that has an impact on people as well. Um, how am I doing for time? Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the US left some more. That's my favorite topic. And that most people in the US left know as little about as, as people anywhere else. Um, we have a situation now, as I said, where there are cleavages between sectors of social movements and this new political movement, which has drawn in so many thousands and maybe hundreds of thousands of people. The influx of people to the Bernie campaign is mostly young and mostly white, which is unusual. It doesn't recall anything. It doesn't even recall the, the uh, the rise of the American SDS in the 60s, where, which became the largest student group, I think, in American history, and very, very radical, but mostly white, which was true less because it started out from a perspective of uh, uh, race isn't important, but because it, it actually uh, started alongside the civil rights movement and was never able to uh, figure out how to really bridge the, the chasm that existed because of the permanent, or up to now permanent, color line in American society, which made it very hard for young, kinda uh, wet behind the ears, uh, white students to come to grips with this enormous history of uh, racial, of, of black oppression and white supremacy, which has been the ear, has been the character of American capitalism from the very, and American society from its very beginnings. And uh, yet and still, one thing about the American SDS in the 60s was that they identified fully with the civil rights movement. And when, after its collapse, dealing with the question of uh, racial organizing versus r interracial organizing was a major question that people were grappling with for years. And then it died down, mainly because the left, between, between uh, re state repression and um, insurmount insurmountable obstacles and just general burnout of, uh, of young activists getting older, uh, the left sort of faded politically and most people retreated, I would say retreat, Without, say, without trying to uh, be condescending, because I think that the work that people were doing was and continues to be the most important work. They retreated into their different social movement projects. And as new generations came in, there was no means for any kind of bridge between the movements. And so it, it, uh, a, f a fragmentation set in that only increased over time. And that was matched by a political incoherence. And now we have a situation where political questions are suddenly leaping to the fore in the form of the demands that, that the Sanders campaign is giving rise to and a lot of people in the social movements who, for all intents and purposes, were the, 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 the greater part of the American left, are having to stop and say, well, this didn't come from us. And it's actually challenging a lot of our leadership who have already decided for Hillary and where do we stand on this? And um, they're grappling with it even now. So you have this phenomenon where 
in the South, uh, the, the black voters who are newly enfranchised, they couldn't vote until the civil rights movement helped them win the right to vote, um, are, ha, seem to be going for Hillary. But if you look a little closer at the, at the uh, statistics that came out of the, uh, the primaries in the South where Hillary beat um, Bernie, you find that um, voters 30 and under voted for Bernie in the majority, and voters 40 and over voted for Hillary in the majority, and that's across the board, across the color line. And what that meant uh, is basically that uh, there were more people voting who were over 40 than there were people voting who were under 30, but that the idea that somehow this was strictly a racial divide is false. And we have more recent developments like the big turnout, which was actually historic, of Muslim voters for Bernie at, in the Michigan primary just this week, uh, which shows that it's not a cut and dried thing. That the, the Hillary campaign has wor been working feverishly to characterize uh, Bernie's campaign as strictly a white, white male phenomenon because the idea is that you look at black votes, voters in black uh, regions and they're, they're voting overwhelmingly for Hillary, which again, as I say, is dubious. But also that uh, all the women naturally want to vote for Hillary because she's a woman, and and Bernie is trying to step on uh, women's hopes and dreams by getting in Hillary's way, which is altogether not true. I mean, nothing about that is true. The fact is that many, many women, mostly uh, in the younger sector, uh, but many, many women are uh, very outspokenly preferring Bernie to Hillary on political grounds, not because they pref obviously not because they prefer a man, but on strictly political grounds, they know that when, when Hillary uh, was part of the Clinton White House, she brought in reforms which were really, really amounted to an attack on poor working women, largely black and brown, um, in the form of taking away uh, welfare for uh, dependent mothers, i.e. single mothers, with no other place to turn, uh, trying desperately to work and keep a family together, getting stipends from the government, and that these were taken away by Clinton under the name of welfare reform. Uh, the so-called war on crime, which was pushed by Clinton, which was where this uh, extreme acceleration of incarceration really, really started, the sharp increase. Um, so people who are aware, women who are aware of this and who feel that feminism means identifying and uniting with all women, particularly the women who are hardest hit by society, reject Hillary and they support, um, and they support Sanders or they feel committed to Hillary but their political, their political heart is much closer to where the, the, Sanders camp, the, the demands that the Sanders campaign is putting forward. Now, where is that going to go politically? It's a challenge. It's a challenge that uh, hits the leadership of, of uh, non-governmental organizations, of uh, left-leaning churches representing uh, various communities, feminist organizations like Planned Parenthood, uh, and especially labor unions, where the leadership it has a long-standing practice of working with the Democratic National Committee, and the Democratic National Committee is 100% behind Hillary. And the membership, who are starting to say, you've made these endorsements before, without consulting us. We don't approve of these endorsements. We want you to at least withhold your endorsement and then we'll see later on in the game how the, how the primary votes go, and then you can endorse. But for now, you know, jumping ahead of the game and supporting Hillary is a stab in the back. And interesting, very interesting, like really important, the, he the leadership of the AFL-CIO, which was uh, until a couple of decades ago mostly a right-wing uh, umbrella group of unions, right of center, we should say, not far right, but right of center. They, Origin, you know, during the Vietnam War, the AFL-CIO basically supported the war. Um, what uh, they've been gradually moving to the left because they've had to face administration after administration, either attacking them or making promises and then breaking them. 
So they're, they're beginning to sour on the idea that they can put all their trust in certain political leaders. And they decided for the first time to withhold support for what was the what was assumed to be the, uh, the the Democratic front runner for the nomination. This is a, you know this is just a little detail in this whole wild campaign thing, but it's actually very very important. It's very relevant. It reflects pressure coming from the bottom, and it also reflects an awareness on the part of the leadership that their interests are moving more and more to the left, more and more in. For in uh, forging closer ties with other social movements. And that's absolutely crucial to the future of the left. And finally, I would just say that um, the political left, which at this point is just a tiny constellation of little sects and, a lot, and some of the more political-minded people in the social movement, are now suddenly face-to-face -face with a huge explosion of people who just came leapfrog, you know, they became politicized and they leapfrogged over the step of becoming radicalized, getting disillusioned and becoming radicalized, and have gone all the way basically into the socialist camp. Because even though lots of people like to say, well, Bernie's not really a socialist, you call Norway socialist, you know, because that's a, those are the kinds of models he points to when, he, when people ask him, what do you mean by socialism? But you gotta understand, socialism was the devil in the United States since for a long, long time. And for, for people to suddenly identify with a, with a candidate who calls himself a democratic socialist without suddenly saying like, well, I support him, but I don't support the socialist stuff. Only a tiny number of people are doing that. Most of the people are saying, socialism, huh? Let me, let me Google that. And then they read what it is, and it's like, huh, okay. And this is, you know, this is unprecedented in the United States. What does the political left do in facing this kind of phenomenon, which they had nothing to do with, I should add. They had nothing to do with it. Suddenly it's like the skies opened up and it's raining socialists. So we got to get our act together really fast. We got to get really, really smart really, really fast. We're going to have to really figure out not just how to organize all these folks into something coherent, when we can barely organize ourselves into anything coherent. But we also have to deal with the very real problem, which is that white folks coming into a radical movement without any kind of experience, in many cases coming from areas that have always been white and their only experience of black people is, you know, hip hop videos, we gotta do some serious talking to and working and, and you know, n not be um, not be condescending, not be authoritarian in our approach. It's a very, very tall order. And uh, if you were Americans right now, you would probably be running for the door because I'm asking people to do something way beyond uh, we believe our, it is our capacity to do, but it isn't. And that's basically what I'm gonna start, go back to talking to people about when I return to the United States.